Hi guys, Freddy here. Welcome back to another Retro RPG. And at the end of another poll, we have a very slim win for the Dungeon Dragon 2nd Edition Arms and Equipment Guide, which I'm shining around here to try and get the cover to show, which I'm going to have problems with, aren't I? It's a very nice cover, though. But, as usual, I'll be back at the end of the video with some more stuff about the poll and other channel-related stuff. And I hope to see you there. So this is the Arms and Equipment Guide, if I can move it slightly so the nice shiny title shows up. Because this is silver on a light blue sort of plastic background, it is made out to be almost like leather, blue leather. But it's plastic covering, much like the complete books, so the complete book of fighters, elves, dwarves, etc, etc, was like the red version of this. Now, this is considered a Dungeon Master's Guide rule supplement, so it's an enhancement to the DMG, whereas the complete books were enhancements to the Player's Handbook. Now, this came out in 1991, so around about the same time as the complete books came out, and really extended out the game in interesting ways. This was one of the handiest books. I really liked this for starting characters, but I'll go into that as I cover through it. Let's have a look at the back. So, Arms and Equipment Guide. At one time or another, every Dungeon Master faces questions like, what's the difference between banded mail and splint mail? What do these pole arms look like? DMs and players alike will be thrilled to find answers to these and other equipment questions in this book, the Arms and Equipment Guide. Lavishly illustrated, the book provides valuable descriptions and diagrams for a variety of armors, weapons, and barding, as well as important items of clothing and equipment. This is the essential volume for the Aquila equipped character. And... It does what it says on the back there. If we flick in, we can see it's standard TSR presentation of the 90s. It's nicely done, but it's nothing spectacular. There is lots of lovely art. And we're straight into, yep, we're straight into padded armor. So we're starting at basically the worst armor. And what we get is an illustration. And we get a lot of detail. So a short description, the armor class, and then campaign use. So it talks about where this would be used. And then we've got leather armour. And it does the same. Um, not a great picture of leather armour, but it gets you the idea. We've got studded leather. And as well as the description and campaign use, we've got a variant here of spiked leather. The small creature inflicts 1 to 2 points of piercing damage. A man-sized creature inflicts 1 to 3 points. And a large creature inflicts 1 to 4 points. So we can see that studded leather is often used by pirates and sailors because it allows them to climb the rigging. It doesn't encumber like they were wearing heavy chainmail. We've got hide armor. And again, it goes through. And this is what the book does. It sort of details variants of it and it gives you a lot of background information. So why this armor might be used. So we've got scale mail, scale mail and sea elf scale mail, coin, coin armor, a variant of scale mail is armor made from the common coins of the realm. This coin armor is seen only rarely, and then usually amongst dignitaries and high generals. So, you know, somebody who would wear gold piece armor or whatever. Brigandine armor. Chain mail and ring mail as an option of it. Banded mail and splint mail with illustrations. Really nice stuff, really useful. It also puts it in its historical so, detailing there, um, used by Mongols, Japanese, or Turks. Uh, bronze plate mail, showing how it's slightly more primitive than full plate. Then we've got plate mail itself, with the campaign use. Field plate, showing how big and clunky it is. It might have the extra armor rating, but you're really going to be staggering around wearing it. Full plate, where... It's fancy, I'll give it that. It's definitely something a king would wear. But a uh, standard adventure, not sure. Gnomish workman's leather armour. So we've got some variants here. Elven chain, a magical elven chain. Drow chain mail. Dwarven plate, a magical dwarven plate. Then we're showing different types of shields. So the buckler, the small shield, the medium shield and the body shield. Different types of helms, so a cap, a coif, an open-faced helmet, closed-faced helmet, or a great helm. 
equipment for mounts. So we've got the different types of barding you can put on. How to protect your horse. Padded barding, leather barding, scale barding. So we're going through the different types of armour we've just seen. But four horses. Right up to your full plate barding. And showing there it's on a different type of animal. Because we are in fantasy here. So who's to say your uh, paladin's not going to be riding a lizard. Saddles, saddle bags. We're on to different types of equipment here. Bridle cutter wielded as weapon. Horse barding. And then we're on to weapons, including arquebus. Battle axes. Now this is something I really liked as a starting character. Going through this book and looking for something different. You know, my character's a ranger and he uses a blowgun instead of a bow. Because he's around the forests and things and dragging out a large bow while you're nipping between trees. Not that handy. Or whatever. Different things. So we've got different types of arrow. Flight arrows, incendiary arrows, sheaf arrows. Different types of weapons. So the cestus, clubs, crossbows, daggers, flails. Oh, I skipped over. We've got daggers, dirks, parrying. We're onto the darts. Gaff and hooks, so something that a shipman might use, just something to have to hand when he's on his ship. He reaches out and he grabs a hook, which you would normally catch rigging or uh, ropes in the water with, but can hack at people with them as they try and board his ship. Harpoons and javelins, different types of knives and lances. Lassoes. Maces. A man catcher. We're going to get onto swords soon and we're going to have a massive variety. Different types of pole arms, the different heads of so Bardish, Bill's Gazam, Fouchard. Uh, pardon my pronunciation as always, they are always terrible. Glaives, halberds, partisans, military forks, just so many different uh, pole arms from around the world. Um, scourges, quarter staffs. Um, spears, sickles, staff slings, long spears. Uh, just so many ideas that, that you can use to customise your character and make them something different. Cut, and we're onto the swords here. Some bastard swords, broadswords, claymores, cutlass, falchions. Now the problem with this is while there's so many lovely ideas, you know, I want my barbarian to carry a um, claymore instead of a standard broadsword. I want my sailor to have a cutlass, because that suits my fighter sailor's background. But to tell the truth, as soon as you start adventuring, you're not really going to encounter a magical cutlass. You're just going to encounter your standard long swords, short swords. So you end up abandoning them. And of course, these are useless for elves, because your elf will get their plus one bonus to hit with short swords and long swords. So you might decide that he's from a Egyptian type culture and he carries a kopesh, but he still only gets his advantage with short swords and long swords, so you're gonna to want to carry them or cap uh basically a penalty to use your sword. We've got rapiers, sabres and scimitars, standard short swords, long swords, um two handed swords, tridents, you want to war hat and some whips. We've got a massive table here showing all the damage. So against small to medium, large, the weight, the size of the weapon, the speed factor. Because of course in second edition Dungeons and Dragons, um weapons have speeds. So using a large battle axe means you will go slower than somebody with a rapier, for example. And then we're on to just generalized adventuring equipment. So backpacks, block and tackle, crampons. Grappling hooks, healers' bags, uh, lanterns, provisions, locks, rope, your thieves' picks, water skins, weapon black. Um, thieves who coat their blades gain a plus five bonus to their chances to hide in shadows for using weapon black. We've got different types of clothing here, so peasant clothing, academical dress, sumptuary laws, brocaded material. Um, Furs, leathers, aprons, different types of bags, baldrics, bands. Just giving you an idea about what people might wear instead of you just saying, oh, they wear a standard robe. 
got caps, calls, cloaks, doublets, and girdles, different types of gloves, shoes, shirts, ruffs, to get all your peasants and nobles dressing more fancy than normal. Um, very pointy shoes, tunics, tabards, and that's us at the end. There's no real advertising in it. We get in and out. Now, it's a great set of different types of armour and equipment. And as I said, it's fantastic for coming up with ideas. So as a games master, it's really nice because you can have your NPCs with something different. And as a starting out player, it can be really, really good because you can get ideas to make your character something a bit different. You know, they are a Roman-style gladiator. They are Egyptian in style. So while they might be an elf or a dwarf, they've got something, you know, a dwarf gladiator with his sword and shield and all that style. But as you go on into a standard Dungeon Dragons campaign, you're going to end up losing this equipment and going for more standard magical equipment. So unless your games master's 100% into it and willing to support you by having turning up in the um, Dragon's Horde that happens to be a plus two Kopesh, you're going to end up dumping that stuff and going for more normal stuff. So that was the Arms and Equipment Guide for 2nd Edition Dungeons & Dragons. And it only just won the poll. That got 29% of the vote compared to the Rigger's Black Book for Shadowrun's 28%. So with only 80 votes cast, that's one vote which made the Arms and Equipment Guide win. So let's see if the Rigger's Black Book will hold up next week, and hopefully I'll get to cover that. But to make up for the Arms and Equipment Guide dropping out of the poll this week, I've replaced it with the Babylon 5 RPG 2nd Edition. Now, one of the guys in my group was moving house a year or two ago, before the pandemic, and needed space for a lot of his uh, stuff, so was giving away a bunch of role-playing stuff he didn't ha uh, use. So passed me on this amongst a bunch of other stuff. And I'd really like to have a look through it. It's not a game I've played, but I'd like to cover the book. So let's see how that does. Now, on other channel-related stuff, I've got two things to mention. Firstly, Gamer Snacks. There's a Gamer Snacks box sitting here waiting to be done. But obviously, I've had a cold the past few weeks, and my son really got choked up with it. So that's been put on hold. But the thing is, I also promised in one of the Gamer Snacks videos which, let's be honest, nobody really watches. It's something me and my son really enjoy doing, but they do not get views. Um, I'm lucky if it, 30 people watch some of them. And most of that's probably friends and family, just to see what we're doing. But anyway, at the end of one of those videos, I mentioned for my 2,000 subscribers, and I'm down to less than 50 people to that now, I would do a Scottish snack box where I would go out and I would buy a bunch of Scottish snacks, different sweets, different crisps, different types of juice that we have here. I'd go with the 10, 12 items that are usually in the Game of Snacks boxes, and we would talk about them and introduce you to things that are quite common here in Scotland, because I'm guessing that people in America and other places around the world might not be familiar with them. So I thought that'd be a bit of fun, but it's going to be a Game of Snacks, so it probably won't get watched that much. The other thing is, I'm just about to start a new series, um, The Path to the, a New Edition. And it's going to be about the different development work that Wizards of the Coast did as they moved from a fairly unsuccessful version, 4th edition, to the enormously successful 5th edition. Because they tried out a bunch of stuff with their D&D Next program. But I'll do a proper introduction for that in the video, the first of which should be out on Friday. But that's going to be like an 11 part series, 10 parts covering the different releases of D&D Next, and then talking about the various things which have been released as we move towards a 6th edition. But that's what's coming up, that'll cover the next few weeks. Obviously I'll drop in rules breakdowns as they come up, but Fridays for the most part are going to be covered by the path to the next edition, and we'll see how that goes. But I think I've witted on for quite long enough, so thank you very, very much for watching. But most of all, as always, you look after yourselves, and I'll catch you later. Bye now.